Hi, this week's weekly roundup of new maker products is pretty quiet. Combined with two back-to-back -back holidays in China and the great MLC shortage of 2018, I am not surprised. This video is being sponsored by JLC PCB. If you want some quick turnaround prototype PCBs, then I highly recommend them. They can produce one to six layer PCBs from 0.4 to 2 millimeters thick with track widths down to 0.01 millimeters and supporting BGAs, cutouts, fingers, and other esoteric things. If you want to check out all their capabilities, then click on the link below. They're currently offering 10 PCBs for only $2, and if you're a first-time customer, you'll get $20 off shipping off your first order. Nice. First up on Kickstarter, the Open MV guys are back, this time with an upgrade on their Cam M7. The new model, tagged the Cam H7, has an STM32H7, which I mentioned back in weekly roundup number 58. Not only does this provide twice the horsepower, but the board has removable camera modules, allowing you to use not only a standard camera, but also thermal and global shutter cameras, capable of tracking up to 16 colors, facial detection, and a bunch of other things like QR and barcode scanning. The FPS specs look pretty impressive too, supporting 400 frames per second using a FLIR module. The board pushes out all the usual GPIO suspects with an SPI and SD bus capable of 100 megabits per second, all powered from either 5 volt micro USB or LiPo battery. You can pick up the basic kit for only 49 US dollars. I wish I hadn't blown my budget for this month. If you're into growing plants of any kind, then here's a new pie hat for hydroponics and aquaponics. Has all the stuff you need with inputs for temperature and humidity sensors, four GPIOs, RTC, two servo outputs, and four relay outputs. It's a little expensive at 76 euros, but has everything you need to get up and running, minus the pie and sensors, of course. If you're into precision GPS location, then you have heard about RTK. RTK allows you to greatly enhance GPS precision by measuring phase changes in GPS signals, along with a reference station. RTK is normally pretty expensive. However, this next campaign brings RTK to the home hobbyist. For 56 euros, you get an Arduino shield with XB header and Ublox ZF9P module, giving you 30mm accuracy. That's pretty cool, but note that you'll need to buy at least two of these since one acts as a reference station and the other as the roaming device. Over at Crowd Supply, there's a new SDR and pre launch from LimeNet called the LimeNet Micro. This is a board based on the Raspberry Pi compute module that provides full SDR capabilities. Running the Lime Microsystems LMS 7002M RF transceiver, which is capable of 10 MHz to 3.8 GHz. It also contains an Intel 10M16 FPGA and is powered from 12V DC jack or PoE. This is the sort of board that will allow you to do a lot of RF hacking. If you're a follower of the 1Bit Squared guys, then you'll know about the Icebreaker FPGA board, which is in pre-launch on Crowd Supply. This is a small breakout board for the ICE 40 FPGA. It also has a couple of PMOD connectors, USB to UART bridge, SPI flash, and a bunch of buttons to mash, and LEDs to flicker. This board is a pretty decent entry into the world of FPGAs, as it is already supported by a lot of the popular HDL tools. Bill Weller has launched his Scoobot on Crowd Supply. This is a pretty cool miniature programmable robot capable of running solo or acting in a swarm. Driven by an NRF52832 MCU with a VL6180X time of flight and light level sensor, microphone, two motors, buzzer, and of course, LiPo battery. It's programmed via Android Studio, Node.js, or Sega Studio. You can make the robot respond to word commands or act in a swarm if you have a bunch of them. The Scoobot and companion board for programming and charging. Back in the day, the Z80, 6502 and 60K were really cool CPUs. Well now, you can get all that coolness in an open hardware microcontroller that contains not one, but all three CPU cores. Yes, please. The Retro UC is a campaign that provides several goodies for the retro hacker. You can pick up your very own Retro UC chip for soldering onto your own PCB, or you can get the Retrino board, which breaks out GPIOs into an Arduino form factor. 
Well, there's the RetroUC breadboard and Proto Plus for those who like to prototype on breadboards. The MCU can activate any of the three cores on reset and has 72 5 volt based GPIOs. You can load up programs on the onboard flash or make use of external SPI flash. Now that's really cool. Over at GroupGets there's a 915 MHz telemetry transceiver kit. This will allow full duplex communication over a 100 mW FHSS transceiver. Access is via USB based UART, so it's just a matter of chucking it in a USB port and away you go. Amazon are ramping up their smart device offering with the Alexa Connect Kit. This is essentially an Amazon Echo on a single IC, allowing you to easily connect any device up to Alexa. There's several caveats however, it's only in preview status and you have to apply for access. And two, there's not only the cost of the hardware, but an upfront fee that covers the cost of ongoing use of the ACK cloud service. So I'm gathering it won't be cheap. Over at Hackaday, they pointed to a guy that converted his Prius to run off the electricity grid of San Francisco's transport service. This is pretty cool, considering that the overhead lines are at 600 volts. Apparently he siphons off the extra volts with a whole lot of resistors, full-time headlights and a kick-ass stereo system. Okay, I guess he managed to get it going despite all the hazards and so far it doesn't seem to be illegal, I think. If you're a maker in the US then you would definitely know all about the World Maker Fair that happened in New York this week. Although I didn't get a chance to visit this year, I've planned to head on over next year. It looked like an absolute blast. Over at Verisite they have a pretty small SOM based on the NXP IMX 6UL. This is a small 25 by 50 mm PCB that is pin for pin compatible with their other modules. To keep the cost down it doesn't have any display output or ethernet connectors but you still have access to them should you need them and it does run the same 900 MHz Cortex A7 SOC as the more expensive modules. So for 24 US dollars you're getting a pretty good bargain. Another company looking for beta testers is Rack Wireless, who are looking for volunteers to test out their new Wiz cellular board. This runs the Quectel BG96 module, which supports 2G, 4G and NB IoT with data rates at up to 300 kilobits per second. This makes it one of the few globally certified mobile comms boards around. Comes in a standard Arduino form factor as well as pushing out a bunch of extra GPIOs and power consumption is only 190 milliamps when running off LTE CAT M1. In a previous roundup we saw the release of the official Raspberry Pi PoE hat. Well it turns out that official doesn't mean it works. There have been numerous issues surfacing with the release of this PCB. Namely when you insert a USB device other than a keyboard or mouse the Pi resets. This is a bit of a surprise coming from a company that normally produces quality products as this sort of thing should really have been picked up during testing. Anyway, there's a big refund happening at the moment, which goes to show it doesn't matter so much that a mistake was made, but how the company deals with it. As I mentioned in last week's mailbag, there's a bit of a shortage on SMT components at the moment, in particular MLCCs. Hackaday have an article up on the how and why of this shortage and goes into it pretty well. The end result is that the shortage has been made worse by the fact that people are now hoarding components. This will have a huge impact on the industry and drive prices even higher. Who knows when things will get back to normal. And over at EV Blog, someone found a $1 sock based on the All Winner A13. The good thing about this sock is that it comes in a TQFP package, which means that if you're really keen, you can solder up yourself a custom PCB. If that makes you nervous, you can pick up a board that has this part from Olimex for around 21 euros. Still, at $1 US for a hand solderable sock, that's pretty darn good. Most MCUs cost twice that. If you want to get into LoRa quickly, then this Tindy store has a LoRa module based on the unusual DRF176G, as well as an ESP32 module, an RS485 transceiver, and an STM32 handling communications. The initial goal was to be able to communicate to RS485 based energy meters. This is a pretty handy little Arduino Pro Mini board that also contains a small monochrome LCD and breaks out a bunch of GPIOs. It has libraries for drawing lines, circles, rectangles and text. 
This is yet another load tester, but this one is fairly programmable. Compatible with most Arduinos, you can get current draw from 0 to 5 amps at 12-bit resolution, or 1.22 milliamps, and measure voltages from 0 to 19.8 volts at 12-bit resolution. It can sync up to 21 watts with a large heatsink and has over voltage, over current and over load protection. Access is over plain USB based UART. Turta IoT is yet another ESP32 based board, but this one is slightly different. Not only does it push out a bunch of the usual GPOs on a breadboard friendly format, but it has a socket that accepts a variety of different modules. Turta have sensor modules for light, temperature, IMU, load, cell and motion, as well as relays, buzzers and IR remote. If you don't know anything about soldering, then get one of these. Over at Palolo, they have a fairly accurate pressure and altitude sensor based on the LPS25HB, capable of measuring from 26 to 126 kilopascals with an accuracy of 0.02 kilopascals and runs off a wide 2.5 to 5.5 volt DC supply. So interfacing to any ITC based logic level is pretty easy. Back in weekly roundup number 55, we saw the Azure Sphere MT3620. Well now Seed Studio are first to market with a board based on this chip. It pushes out all the GPIO goodness from a 500 MHz Cortex-A7 based SOC running Azure Sphere OS. If you want to get into a cloud based service very quickly, then this looks pretty good. From the other end of the spectrum, they have a small vibration sensor in stock. This is a pretty easy way to add in basic movement sensing into your project and will detect any movement with controllable accuracy. Nice to see SparkFun selling round TFT LCDs. These are fairly basic units that you'll need to spend some time soldering up, but still, if you can handle that, then you have a pretty neat SPI based display. Back in weekly roundup number 52 and 57, we saw the Nutis N5 module. Well now, SparkFun are selling them. Seems they have sorted out their shipping issues. Finally. SparkFun also have in their SAM D21 based Spark X board. This has onboard SX1276 LoRa module, but boosts output to 1 watt. They've also broken out a watt of GPIOs for you to hack around with. They also have in their Wi-Fi IR blaster, which not only contains an ESP8266, but an IR transmitter and receiver. This will allow you to do some cool stuff like interfacing any IR controlled device with MQTT, IFTTT, or even Alexa. DF Robot have in their fourth generation of their tilt compensated compass. This allows you to maintain an accurate compass reading regardless of the orientation of the device. Powered from 3.3 to 5 volts and draws 18 milliamps quiescent current. And this is a first. DF Robot also have a pH sensor kit with durable probe and gravity based board which outputs a voltage level based on the pH reading. They also have several pH solutions for testing. Adafruit have in a flexible silicon based NeoPixel RGB LED strip. It is not waterproof and they also don't guarantee it for long term outdoor use, but pretty handy anyway. Runs off a 9 to 12 volt DC supply. And they also have in a 5 pack of these infrared reflective optical sensors, which can be better or worse than the disruptive optical sensors depending on your application. However, they are responsive enough to measure the RPM of most motors, which is good really because you don't usually want to use a disruptive sensor for that sort of thing. And Adafruit also have in a Pi based 4 inch display. This one is slightly different as it uses the parallel RGB666 interface of the Pi. So that means all of your GPIOs are used up. However, like my Pi projector, it does mean that you can drive the display faster than an SPI interface and play 60 frames per second video on it. Nice. If you enjoyed this video, then don't forget to hit like. And if you haven't already subscribed, it would be great to have you on board. And if you want to be able to support me further, you can join the fabulous group of patrons I have over at Patreon or via PayPal, some of which have been supporting me for the last two years. So thanks for watching and see you next week.